Hello, James here, WSI, and I'm not messing up any intros, Mikey, let me tell you that for nothing. But thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. And it is the ECW former Triple Crown winner himself, Mikey Whitbrack, with a very, very rare interview these days. Thank you very much for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. But I have a question. How can I be a former Triple Crown winner? Either, either I'm a Triple Crown winner or I'm not. I messed I can, up I the intro be former, because I meant, to, I, think. I meant to say former ECW. Okay. Former champion. That, See? Uh, oh, damn it. You, you, you said you weren't going to fuck it up. But I said, if you did fuck it up, we have to be sure you air it anyway. That's fine. So now people know that you fucked up. And there it is. So you're human. Yes. And also, I'm very lazy very with the editing. So you're lazy I, with, with, the, oh, with the editing? Yes. So, I don't know. I, I might drop that C-bomb, so you might have to... Oh, uh, God, don't. Don't. I, I, may force, I may force you to edit <laughs> by accident. If nothing else, it gives me an excuse to do a really charming... <laughs> or some sort of, like, bleeping noise that you don't hear very often. Uh, do you, know, like, you know, like the Andy Kaufman thing when he swore on um, Letterman? And instead of just, like, going beep, he went boing, or whatever it was. You get creative. Yeah. As long as you're creative, it's fine. Yeah. Say, so, okay, who's this foolish man doing the editing? The groveler. It's Chris Maddox, by the way. He is your editor for this uh, episode. Oh, Chris I was Maddox, like, good luck, buddy. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you in advance. Yes. So, you're cold. You're, uh, <laughs> that's the first thing you the said. Heat, I'm freezing. The heat in my office is broken and it's fucking cold in here. So, so I refuse to put on a jacket, though I did put on a hat. And I left my AirPods home, and I have a shitty headset. So, yeah, and a migraine. So things are going well. There we go. I won't shout too loudly. I won't shine any lights in your face like I've got to. As I said before, I get a tan with this every single time I do one of these podcasts with these lights in my face. But I got one like this That's as well. You, you just got back from Mexico. Holy shit. <sighs> I know. God. It's aggressive. Yes. It yeah, see, now you, have a, now you have a huge glare. Oh, on that good book okay. back there. Oh, uh, there you, you mean, go. You okay. Mean Owen, Owen looks good now. Yeah, I was going to say, you mean the book, book I yeah. wrote, Owen Hart, King of Pranks, uh, written by yours truly. Thank you very much for bringing that up, Mikey. You're welcome. I had, you know, I got to get a plug in. See, your your mistake got a plug in for your book. There you go. I, uh, I'm i going to ask you a question now. And I don't know. we I have an answer. Uh, well, uh, hopefully you have an answer as well. Wrestling Organization Online, we're going to go there straight away. Woo game. Uh, Okay, so basically, this is an online uh, game, wrestling game, um, where you uh, collect player cards, superstar cards, and things like that. And you can put matches together, like you put a card together, and you can compete against other people online. And I don't know too, 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 too much about the whole back end and the Hive blockchain and the crypto part of it and everything else. But what I do know and what I do like about it is Hive thing, it's a very it's a very community-based um, platform. And there's all kinds of different shit that people are putting on this Hive blockchain. They're putting like a, it, like an, it's called in Leo, which is like a, a Twitter type platform. Uh, there's Peak D, which is like a long form blog uh, type community. And there's all different kinds of video games on there. And there's like a video streaming uh, thing on there. So you could pretty much develop anything you want on this blockchain. And it's all community based and it's all cool. And there's actually, unlike normal crypto, like here, Bitcoin, which is just money based, based on no money, on nothing for some reason. I don't, I don't really understand that either. But this, at least, there's some sort of something behind it. Um, some sort of utility mm. um, where it actually makes sense. So with the Woo part, um, it's an online video game. You can buy, uh, like I said, crates and items and things, and you open them and surprise what you're going to get. Um, we're partnered with uh, Perry Saturn is involved, Sonny Ono, Terry Reynolds, uh, Ernest Miller, uh, Just Incredible, uh, my old buddy Tajiri. Uh, he's all signed on. Uh, and it's cool. So you collect our player cards, and then, like I said, you can make all your collections, and then you can set up cards and matches and play against other players. Uh, and the good thing about the card thing is, unlike a traditional, traditional, can you say traditional, about an NFT? 
at this point. Um, it's actually a card that you own. So you own this player card with these attributes that say Tajiri has, and you own it. So if you want to trade your Tajiri card for a Perry Saturn card or sell it so someone else can buy it, um, like I said, there's utility to it and there's actual ownership, not like, say, like the NBA Top Shot NFTs where you're just basically buying an ESPN video clip that you really can't do anything with but look at. So at least with the Woo stuff, you can actually play a game. Yeah, I, I do like a general management yeah. sim as well. And these kind of things, I'm like the, the old RPGs and stuff. I don't, how big of a gamer are you? There you go. Not. You've never been a gamer? At all. Not real. I mean, I've had like PlayStation, Xbox, but I never really like, hey, what's the cool guy? I'll play Madden, mm. you know, FIFA. Ah, well, I'm glad you mentioned FIFA so. as well because with the cards and you buying the cards and then you're sort of, you know, battling with the cards with the wrestlers' attributes on them. Yes. It's, it's very FIFA like uh, with the crates and okay. the loot as well, in, in that sense, I believe. Back in the late 80s, 90s, there was a hockey game called Stratomatic, where you actually had physical cards that you would put your team together and then you roll the dice and based on the dice and what player combinations you had compared to what they had would determine on what happened on that particular play. So it was it's it's similar to that in my opinion. Yeah. Which is cool. Like I said, there's you're actually owning something that you can use. Not like a typical NFT where here's a picture of a frog smoking a cigarette on a mountain. <laughs> just it's there. Uh, how so, do you how do you guys cool. how do you guys benefit from it? Um, we actually we get. I believe we all share. They call us partners. So all the partners, all the wrestlers, we share in ten percent of the profits of the game. And anytime one of our specific cards is sold, we get a hundred percent of the transaction fees and all that stuff that that goes along with it. So mm. it's it's cool. I, I like I said, I don't know too too much about it. I'm kind of new to it. Um, but what our our buddy the Booker Man, I won't say his real name because I don't know if people know what his real name is. It's Kevin Sullivan. But yes, yes, <laughs> he's the Booker Man. He waves a giant pencil at me. He tells me <laughs> what to say and when to say it. That's cool. So it's woo.game is the website you can check out. There's links to the Discord and all that good stuff on there. And in the Discord, if you join the Discord and ask questions, the community is very helpful at just spitting out, oh, try to do this or go here and look at this and, and go here and do this. So it's if I could figure it out at 50 years old and actually kind of, okay, I kind of get it. Um, kids watching this can, can do it. So Also, you have a blog on the hive slash peaks as well and i actually read through quite a few of them so before um i'm sorry carry on no that's i was gonna bring that up too the whole so the peak d is, is the long form blog uh site that i use there might be other ones but peak d is the one i like um and, and you can make money this and this is the part that blows my mind so you hear about creating a blog and if you want to set up a blog you can eventually monetize your blog and make money Right, that, that's everybody's goal when they do a blog and a WordPress and all that stuff. But but this is like once you get in the community, people just by liking your blog, and when you like a blog, there's certain percentage points of your your voting power, I guess they kind of call it. Um, how much that you can designate to that blog, how much you like, and the, the more you're involved and the more you get into it, the more credibility and the more uh, power you have. You can go vote higher and higher. So, like, there are blogs I'm writing that are just me, and I have like 49 followers, maybe. That that's making me like 45 bucks mm. just writing blog posts. You know, so I mean, it's it's cool. It's plus, you can inter interact with people. You know, and you see people on there; they're making 10 cents for post and things like that. But it doesn't really cost you anything. You're just going on there, you're doing your thing, and then you're just upvoting, and little by little, you amass quality i guess if, if you want to buy some of their crypto i guess you can increase your buying power and your voting power but for right now it's just fun like i'm blogging i'm getting stuff out that's stuck in my head and i usually use twitter but you're kind of limited to what you could put on twitter as far as character counts and things so this is peak d i'm kind of i'm digging it 
Do you know, I read through a few of your blog posts before we came on air, and I hadn't realised how much I actually missed reading wrestler blogs because since, as you say, social media's come out, the long-form writing is sort of maybe not died to death, but I, I don't really know too many people who do it anymore. Uh, like New Jack used to do it, I think. Perry Satin used to do it. Um, oh, really? Dirty Dutch, uh, Dutch Mantel. My podcast partner used to do it on Facebook all the time, and then since we started the podcast... All the stories seem to just go in video form instead, and it's sort of a bit of a lost art just sitting there and enjoying a blog post. And one of them that I thoroughly enjoyed that sort of tied into... I was wondering why uh, the guys at Woo Games kept saying, bring up Sheet Dick. It'll, it'll pop Mikey. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I was like... Sheep Dick. And, and I was like, how am I supposed to bring that up in polite conversation? But then I read the blog post about your meeting with Bobby Heenan. So what better... Way to sort of start this off with a good old story about how you met Bobby. So I I was a huge Bobby Heenan fan. Uh, even, so my introduction to Bobby was 85, 86, I guess, in WWE. And he was the weasel. He was the bad guy. He was managing Big John Studd, King Kong Bundy, uh, and maybe Paul Orndorff at that time. Maybe it was 86. Anyway, around that time frame. And I just found myself liking Bob. Like, I like this guy. And my brothers could not understand it. My parents could they go, how can you like this? Like, how can you like him? I said, I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. And then he would be on primetime wrestling with Gorilla co-hosting. And then he would do wrestling challenge co-hosting with Gorilla. And uh, Later on, I realized, I go, I like this guy because I just knew that this guy was fucking good. You know what I mean? Even though he was a heel, he kind of made it like an ass of himself. And he was like shady, but he could never be shady and get away with it, especially with Gorilla. And it was just like, man, like, I just like this guy. So I became a huge Bobby Heenan fan. Then just the commentary with the one-liners and everything, just fucking amazing. So when I went to WCW, and I got to meet him and introduce myself. And he asked me, he said, so your last name is Whipwreck? I go, yes, sir. He goes, hmm, sheep dick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, we, so we had the Metro Kidman come back. And I was talking to Taz. I think it was Taz or my brother. I forget which one it was. And... So if I say Taz or my brother in the story, it could be one or the other. But I th I'm pretty sure it was Taz that said to me, Bobby Heenan called you Sheep Dick. He was playing with your name the whole time. Because Bobby asked, can I play with your name? I said, Brain, you could do whatever you fucking want. Like, I don't give a like, I don't care. You're talking about me? Like, I don't care what you say. And Taz goes, he, brother, he called you Sheep Dick on fucking... I said, what? So when I saw Bobby later, I said... Hey, Bobby, I said, you know, thank you for, you know, commentary during the match. Thank you for that. I said, did you call me sheep dick? He goes, oh, I didn't say sheep dick. He goes, you were, tonight you were lamb penis. Because <laughs> like, so I guess he didn't want to admit that he called me sheep dick. Um, but yeah, he played with my name. And it was fucking just like amazing. Is this just, did he and, just take a shine to you straight away? Because I mean, from reading the blog post on Hive, by the way, I'll put the link up for everybody. That he, the way you write it, he just for whatever reason just took a shine to you straight away. He, he, yeah, and we didn't talk a lot. You know, we didn't hang out. You know what I mean? It was just when I would see him, you know, it was just funny, ha ha, and a big smile every time I saw him. And you know, it got a point where I'd actually would give him a hug when I saw him, and I only saw him ten times, fifteen. Like it wasn't a lot because I didn't work there. I mean, I was there for almost a year, but I'd only. A handful of fucking matches and yeah it was just great and i've had good thing i've good things in my wrestling career the stuff with cactus the stuff with steve austin to jerry all that good shit but one of the biggest highlights of my career is was the night after the bash on the beach with that junkyard invitational match where everybody got fucking hurt mm. uh i had a concussion i was wrestling steve regal on nitro and I had no idea what the fuck was going on. And I'm walking around the ring and Bobby stood up and shook my hand on TV. And I'm thinking to myself, please God, let that be on camera. 
And I'm thinking to myself, he doesn't do that. Like he doesn't like stand up and like shake people's hands. You know what I mean? Like, it's like he wasn't there. So for me, I'm thinking, he just he just kind of, in a way, put me over on TV by shaking my hand. So I was fucking like fucking giddy. <laughs> Concussed as all hell, but fucking giddy. <laughs> so, well, you managed to get on amazing. camera at least. Uh, which episode was this on? Because I know someone's going to try and find it. Do you remember? I don't, do you remember what whatever, the town was? Whenever, I think it was in Memphis. It was the night after the, the bash at the beach. So when we did that junkyard invitational on that Sunday, it was the next day on Nitro. Right. So if you look at the date, you'll be able to figure it out. It's because so. say detectives get out there and, and try and find it and uh, get, a, get a gift. Somebody snagged me. So, somebody snagged me a really good gif of it or a screenshot. Because anytime I tried to get one, it was blurry. Yeah. But this was back in the day on videotape. Oh, so when you pause it, it's doing like that anyway. Yeah, it's like really blurry and shitty. It's not like now you just pause it, it like freezes clearly. Do you know, talking about Bobby, and this is 1999 we're talking as well. At any point did you talk to him? Did he just seem exasperated with WCW? Because I believe towards the end he just wasn't happy being there. He told me. He, he said, he goes, he goes, sheep dick. He goes. <laughs> <laughs> he said, this place is a sinking ship. He said, if you can get out, get out. He goes, but until then, on, on, on the 1st and the 15th of the month, just get your paycheck. He goes, but this place is a sinking ship. I said, you think so? He goes, they have no idea what the fuck they're doing. I said, oh, okay. And then, yeah. And then a year later, it was uh, not that long after that. It was maybe two months late because that was at... When did I see him? The Great American Bash. It was a Great American Bash in Baltimore when I wrestled Van Hammer for some god unknown reason. Uh, that's what he told me. It was a sinking ship that just get your check and get out. And then like two minutes later, Eric got fired. They brought Russo in and then and it really kind of went from where it went to where it went. Mm. Oh man, I used to watch I used to watch every because we couldn't get raw at the time because like it had to be on Sky Sports. And now you know that was mm -hmm. like HBO, you know, for you guys. It was a big paywall, so I was a, a WCW avid watcher at the time. And yeah, you could see week to week. You could see week to week. You know, you, I didn't know anything about the backstage stuff, but just maybe it's just the pushing of David Flair for me that I knew something was going a bit wrong. So for me, what what made me leave was they put the cruiserweight belt on Evan Courageous. So that was more offensive than Oklahoma or like Medusa. Well, this is before that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't. But was it Medusa? I don't know if Medusa was there, but it was before Oklahoma for sure. Mm. And I just remember talking. My, my idea was when when I went back to ECW and, and I did my purgatory there and and paid my dues again, for Paul would start using me in in a better spot. My idea was the whole devil thing, with the red hair, crazy Mikey to go with Jimmy Hart in the Dungeon of Doom. Because Jimmy asked me if I would mind if he would be my manager. Because Jimmy wanted to get into the Cruiserweight stuff, I guess, or whatever. Whatever the reason was, Jimmy asked if that would be something I would be into. And I said, fuck, fuck, Jimmy, fuck, yes. Jimmy Hart, fucking friend of Hogan, like, fuck, Jimmy Hart. I don't even care. Like, just fucking managed by Jimmy Hart. Yeah. So I was going to do the red hair, crazy fucking Mikey at that point. And... They didn't go with me and Jimmy at all. And I remember saying to Perry Saturn, um, I think I want to do this. He goes, don't do it. I said, why not? He said, because they're not going to do anything with you. It's going to be the same thing. You just waste this new look on them. I said, oh, okay. Uh, so I was going nowhere, not getting anything. And I was watching Evan, who looked like a fucking million bucks. Nice enough guy, but he wasn't very good. To be honest. And he was blowing spots left and right and just wasn't any good. And then they put the cruiserweight belt on him and my head fucking exploded. Mm. That's when I, that that was when I went back and, and was in the stage of oh, I want to work. I want to get a push. I want I want this. I you know, I gave a fuck at that point. Instead of worrying about just getting money, I was worried about my, you know, actually wrestling. And that's when I said that's enough. And I called Taz and who's still in ECW. I said, Taz, I I'm quitting. Fuck this. It's, 
But yeah, my head exploded because they put the belt on this poor kid and I was very angry. (laughs) Do you know, it's a really, really clever thing that Perry said to you there. Don't waste a new look. Because if you go back to ECW with a new look, then you're a completely refreshed character. And the WCW run is effectively cancelled. Pretty much, yeah. That was it. Yeah. That's a really clever thing. But here's the thing. If I had stuck it out and waited for Vince Russo to get there, maybe. But I had no idea Vince Russo was coming in. You know what I mean? As far as I knew, it was the end of August '99, and it was it was what it was. So I figured, ah, this is not going to go anywhere. So this is kind of over. We will, uh, if we've got the time, by the way. Oh, uh, I didn't tell you this either. I said, um, and this will actually tie into the next question I'm going to ask you. I said to the WSI subscribers, throw us some questions. Anyway, we got like a couple of hundred. You got one least. question. I what? Yes. Did you get at least one question? A, a good couple of hundred. So I had to whittle. Shut the fuck up. A I couple had to, hundred. Yeah, I had to whittle. I had to whittle this script down to six wow. pages. So, okay. so we've got enough what for like we an omnibus. Uh, we're at one th- one third of uh, page one. I may have to come back. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll do the greatest hits version, and then if there's a uh, you know if there's any desire to come back, I'll okay. I'll uh, definitely let you. But uh, several people wrote this in anyway. Actually, that's what I was going to get out. So when I said Mikey's coming on. Give us some questions. I used the photo of you, uh, 2K16, and the WWE game. And I thought someone, I thought a fan had made it because I'd stopped playing the WWE games for years. And then loads of people had written in, uh, ask Mikey about being in the game. And then I, it clicked, and I remembered that you were in like the Steve Austin uh, uh, sort of like history yeah. chronology. Uh, 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 what do you call it? My career or something like that with Steve Austin. And what yep. a way to get into the game. I hadn't realized that you were in there. Like, completely out of nowhere, I get this phone call from, that was Mark Carano, one, one of the guys. And I'm like, hey, this is, you know, who someone saw from, from WWE. I'm like, hey, what's up? I'm going, okay, there's got to be bullshit. Like, I don't. I have never called them for a job. I've never anything. Anytime any, anybody's done everything, it's been they call me, which is rare as fuck. Three times, I think they've called. Let's see, they called me for the two ECW pay per views. They called me one time for uh, to be a talking head for network shit they were filming. We did twice for that, and then this video game thing, and. I'm like, yeah, okay. How do you want to make some money? I said, sure. What do I have to do? And they go, just sign your name. I said, well, I can fucking do that. <laughs> and they told me it was about, you know, the, the, the game they were developing was based on Steve Austin's career. And I was a big part of his career. And I said, let's, I said, I said, let's not get carried away. I was not a big part of Steve Austin's career. He was a big part of mine, but I was a fucking hiccup <laughs> for, for him. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, yeah, and that that was it. And then they fucking put me in the game because I had um, Trent Beretta. I trained Trent Beretta and Mike Mondo, who's Mikey from the Spirit Squad. They were doing the motion cast for the game. And they told me, he goes, well, y- you must have signed your contract because they have us doing all your moves. I said, what, laying down? <laughs> yeah, I'm laying down. But... But yeah, that was it, man. It was it was cool as shit, you know. And it's 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 funny that that match against Steve Austin has made me more money than anything else. So him coming in in '95, and I I guess we're gonna jump around a little bit, but hmm. me being a big fan of his, even when he was in uh, was it world class or global? I forget where he was, but when he first started, global, global. Uh, no, it was, it was world class. Oh, with um. He did do global um, as well, though, and then he went WCW. But he was in USWA at some point as well, I think. Wherever he was, he was with Chris Adams. He was doing stuff with Chris Adams. That's when I saw it. And big fan. And then maybe in global. But WCW is when I'm like, oh, fuck, this guy is fucking amazing. Like, I fucking love this guy. And then he came to ECW. And then Paul said, oh, yeah, you're going to work with uh, Steve Austin next month. And I lost my shit. Like, holy fuck, this is fucking, this is amazing. So I figured what a fucking lose to Steve Austin. Cool. Like, I don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? Like, uh, great. And 
we we get there that night of the of the match, and Steve goes, "Okay, kid, sunset flip hook the tights." I'm going, "What?" He goes, "So that's the finish." I said, "You're hooking my tights." <laughs> like I'm like, "You beating me with a, a sunset flip?" Like it doesn't make. He goes, "No, I'm putting you over." I said, "I said you fucking ripped me." I'm like, "Get the fuck out of here." He goes, "No, I'm serious." He goes, "I'm not." You know, no offense, but me beating you is not really gonna do anything. I said I don't, and I don't think I'm sticking around very long. You know, so let let me put you over. You've put the work in. I'm like, oh, holy shit! Like, okay, <laughs> like to this day, any any time I think like, oh, you're gonna win the the TV belt, your first belt ever from Pitbull. Yeah, fucking rib, no fucking way. Hmm. And then you're going to lose it to Jason. Oh, and then a month later, you're going to team with Cactus Jack, replacing Terry Funk. Oof. Shut the fuck up. You're fucking ribbing me. And now the stuff with, with with Steve. And the thing with Steve, am I jumping around like crazy here? I think I'm jumping don't, don't around. Don't you worry about that. You know, this is this is free form. You know, this is off. Say what you yeah. say. So I had gone just from a program with the Sandman. And Hack would call everything. A to fucking Z, like everything in between, every little nuance, hit with the cane, one, two, three, stick, four, like, you know what I mean? Like every little detail down. And then I worked with Steve and he said, it's such a flip hook the tights. I'm like, uh, okay, that's, that's, that's what we're doing. Like, and I'm like, okay, I'm used to selling and getting beat up because I was a beat up guy for a while. So I'm like, oh, that's easy. You know, I'm, okay, I'm going to. Get the shit kicked out of me by Steve and just he'll call Sunset and we'll go home. Well, uh, we we go to get into the ring and he's telling me to get out of the ring. Right just when it starts, he goes gathering. I'm going, do I get out? Not get out? It's like, is he really telling me to get out because he wants me to get out? Is he working telling me to get out, wanting me not to get out? So now I'm mind fucked. I have no idea what the fuck is going on. So I kind of go and I kind of half get in, I kind of get out. And then he jumps me, beating the shit out of me. And then he gives, we're on the floor and he gives me the Iggy to reverse. So I reverse him into the guardrail and he says, take over. I had no idea what to do. <laughs> I, I literally, I go, what the fuck am I going to do? Like, I don't, I don't know what to do. Like, I just, I, I, I just totally froze up. I had no idea. Are you dealing with being so, starstruck at the same time as all this is going on? No, no, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't starstruck. I was in reality because he was beating the shit out of me. Because yep. <laughs> he, he, he'll throw, he'll throw some fucking punches mm. safely. But you know, he's, you know, he's there. You know what I mean? And I just didn't know, like what, to, like I didn't know what to do. Like I just really didn't, didn't have the experience to on the fly to do shit. And anything I would really do, I kind of would have to tell him ahead of time, kind of. So, and I'm just like, I don't, I don't want to dive on him. Because he just came back from touring his triceps. So I don't. So I rolled him back in the ring and I'm kind of stomping him in the corner. And I think he finally just said, okay, enough. And he said, reverse stun gun. So we did a reverse, came back, and he stun gunned me. And then from there, but yeah, fucking amazing. And I, like I said, him just being completely unselfish and just be, being cool as fuck and all about business got me a huge win for me and, you know, has made me more money and I get. Ask this question all the time. Hmm. How does it feel beating Steve Austin? It, 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 it's fucking it, amazing. It, felt. It, it doesn't sound like you're sick of talking about it either, man. I mean, it, it's, it's I just, massive. Like I'm talking, I'm partly talking to you today because of Steve Austin. Otherwise, I you know, he did this. He did a couple of things. Because uh, I'm, I'm linked with with Steve in this way. The same with Cactus. You know, I'm just linked with these two guys. It's just it's helped me out as far as staying somewhat i wouldn't say relevant but known do you, do you think uh, just very briefly just on the game itself do you think that steve austin requested you to be in the game get you a payday that kind of thing or was that something from within the 2k people who brought you on I wouldn't be surprised if he did but i don't know couldn't uh couldn't really tell you now <clears throat> I'm I'm going to skip ahead here because you've mentioned Steve Austin. So we had obviously quite a few uh, people writing in with it. Ken Terminator says, "What was the experiences with Steve Austin? Uh, pretty much, was he a good guy or a jerk?" Plus, uh, 
something about the stunner that we'll get to at another point. But essentially, he sounds like all about business, good guy. Amazing. Just fucking, just a good dude. Like, Texas fucking redneck just came in, loved the business, wanted to do business, wasn't selfish, and was just fucking amazing. Like, amazing. Were you ever present with any of the uh, interviews he did? I don't, because I'm yes. not, oh, so you were behind the camera actually watching some of these? Yeah. Amazing. Which ones? Fucking just all of them. Just, just him doing the, when he first came in, uh, he did like the Hulkamania promo where he was on a stairwell or something. It's like, this, this like you just see the Christmas, like, man, that was awesome. Like it was, it's fucking cheesy as hell. He's doing fucking Hulk Hogan, but it's fucking, but he's making fun of Hulk Hogan. So it's just fucking cool as shit. You know, you can just tell that like the charisma, like when he did the, um, I don't know if I was there for the, the Monday NyQuil one. I don't know if I was in the room for that one, but just, just, it, it just seems so easy. It's just like natural, like, Oh, kind of promo. Okay. And he went and it really, it really was. It did seem like the beginning of the stone cold character. Cause like he was kind of developing that, like, I don't give a fuck type attitude uh, in ECW. And then he went and became the ringmaster and then it kind of got muted a little bit. Um, and then he just fucking exploded. <laughs> with Steve also with the ECW run, he seems to go through about four different haircuts in the space of about three months. Cause it was like super long Hogan whittled down, whittled down until he had like a buzz cut. So you can always, you can tell by the week, which week it is without having, you know, without knowing what show it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I worked him that, the second match we had, the three-way with Sandman, um, which I hated that match. By the way. Is that Terrible. November to remember? The one after. No, yeah, November was the one-on-one -on -one with Steve, and then we came back the following month with three-way. I, I, I hated that match. I hated it. Like, it just didn't, it didn't feel right. Like, I'm just like, it just didn't click for me. Um, but he had the, he had the, he had shaved his head. And they were calling him Forrest Gump. <laughs> and they were going, gee, son of a bitch. <laughs> Just pretty funny. Did you always know? I mean, you, you alluded to it before saying, no, I don't know if he was going to be here for a long time. But was it always known that this was a short stop for him? Or was he ever planning to make it maybe a year in ECW or something like that? I don't know, because I think I thought when Cactus came in, he was going to be there like two months well, when he first came in, he was still with WCW. And then he quit WCW, put his notice in. And they, I think they put the tag belts on him after he gave his notice, which was weird. But I thought Cactus was only going to be around for a couple months, and then he'd be gone. But he was around for, like, almost two years. So, like, I couldn't see Steve sticking around. Like, I would have fucking loved for him to stick around, but... I, it's just, there's no way this guy's sticking around. Like they're, they're going to scoop this guy up. Now uh, I teed you up with this question beforehand, <clears throat> and since we're speaking about Steve Austin, you know what's coming. Who invented the stunner, all that kind of thing? And you said, hey. "Well, it depends how I feel whether I'm going to give the real answer or not <laughs> on this." But um, okay, right. So uh, uh, I'll tell you what I think, and then you tell me I'm wrong, and tell me where I've gone completely wrong. You invented the stunner where you sit, where you sit down on your posterior. And I believe it's from the second rope, the whippersnapper. I believe that you invented it, definitely off the second rope, but I thought yes. you invented the one where you actually sit down rather than an ace crusher or what Michael Hayes was doing, which was more of like a uh, front face lock and then everyone lands on their back and front kind of thing. Am I completely wrong? Okay. Half and half. Half and half. So, what the, the, the whippersnapper, the one I did, was off the middle rope, which seemed like a good idea at the time. Looking back, not, uh, not so much, but I got the stunner from Jimmy Garvin. He came to he was in, he, he was he was gone from WCW for a while, and then he came back on a random pay per view. I think it gets Johnny B. Bad. He had he, he had been a pilot at that point. He had shaved his head, and he came randomly out of fucking nowhere. 
Uh, and he did a move to Johnny B. Bad the Stunner, and he called it the 911. And I said, Ooh, I think I'm going to steal that. I think I'm going to use that. And so that's where it came from. That was the origins of the Stunner for me. Just when, so whenever, if you look up, whenever Jimmy Garvin wrestled Johnny B. Bad with a shaved head, he did the 911. So I started using it. I said, Fuck, I'm going to start using it. Well, Steve started using the stunner out of reference, at a, at a suggestion from Michael Hayes. Now, I don't, I don't know if it was like the Ace Crusher he was getting it from or whatever. Or he saw Jimmy do it to Johnny B. Bad or whatever the fuck it was. So either way you look at this, the stunner, the whippersnapper can all be credited to the Freebirds. There you go. Where do you mention Johnny B. Bad as well? I interviewed him yesterday. Of all things. Oh, did you? I did. He's, he's uh, deliriously happy, that fellow, let me tell you. Um, WCW Halloween Havoc 1991, it says. 91? Holy Th- shit. Does that sound right? Because I still thought he had long okay, hair at that be. point. It could be. Buddy, I don't know. I, yeah. I, just, I just remember I was at the ECW school, um, got there before everybody else. And was just watching tapes. And one of the tapes I picked up was this Halloween Havoc and was just watching it. And so it very well could have been 1991. There you go. Well, I mean, you get full credit, partial credit. You you, you get some sort of credit for popularizing popularizing the move, if nothing else. And then Steve Austin. People say Steve Austin took over you and that kind of thing. But whoever invented the I don't know the. uh, Sorry, I don't know the exact. I don't know the exact timeline of who, who did it first or what. But it's all the free birds. So I like like everything else, I stole it. There's nothing like ninety nine percent of the moves was stolen or it, borrowed. I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of people seem to have done the stunner afterwards. I've written a little list here of variations of so Kevin Owens does the stunner, Grayson Waller does some sort of like he rolls into the ring and then hits a the stunner. Uh, uh-huh. Ryback does some sort of military press into a stunner, or he did anyway. Orange Cassidy and the Stun Dog Millionaire. There's like a million different variations of it now. Have you got any, as one of the forefathers of the stunner maneuver, let's call you that if nothing else, uh, which of the modern versions of the stunner or the people who do the stunner do you like the best? The one I like least is the one John Cena would do. Yes, I'd written that, that springboard thing, yeah. Yeah, that would be the worst. <laughs> Um, not the best, is it? Steve Austin did it the best. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to move on. B, uh, the BC313 oh, has asked, uh, Mikey, can I ask you about your memories of being in the crowd for the first ever Monday Night Raw? Loved it. So, yeah, so it was general admission, and it was... We had no idea what to expect because it was the first one. We didn't know anything. And me and my friends, we took the train in from Long Island to Penn Station, um, walked a couple blocks to the Manhattan Center, which is upstairs from the Hammerstein Ballroom, for those of you wondering, same building. And yet we waited outside for hours and hours and hours in the cold in January, freezing. Um. They opened the doors and we fucking beelined it. You had to go. We ran up the stairs. I think you could have taken the elevator or the stairs. I'm not sure which one we took. But we remember walking into the room and it was the first live TV taping I'd ever been to. Um, everything else was at the Nassau Coliseum or the Garden, just house shows. Um, and just running. And we remember talking to the people. Actually, Vlad, you know, Vladimir? That's, that was my next question. Did you ever meet Vladimir? Yeah. Yeah, yes. So Vladimir was there and he said, yo guys, you want to be on camera? Go across from the camera. So you'll see the camera set up. Go opposite there. I said, okay. So, because we were just going to go get in the front. We didn't fucking know where. And because of Vlad screamed, go over there. We went to, to the hard cam. But it was amazing. Front row. We we bought belts that my friend Mike Norman had made out of, uh, he would go to like Home Depot or Lowe's, like a home improvement store. And he would buy kick plates for the bottom of a, of a door, like the front door, you know, like the gold, the bronze or whatever. And he would literally cut them out and engrave them and layer them. He'd buy silver ones and gold ones 
and he would make belts, which back in the day, the belts we had were fucking sick because a lot of people, oh, they made a belt with cardboard and aluminum foil. And is it, but yeah, we had legitimate, like he would, he bought like cheap leather and he would make like leather straps for them. It, it, these things were deluxe for back in 1991, 92, 93. Things are freaking deluxe. Yeah. Did you make it in the first row or the second? First row. First row. And also, just because... First row, was... I'm sorry. No, for the, for the first row, we were in the front row. I think we went back a couple weeks later, and we were like maybe three rows back. But, yeah, first one, we were in the front row. I, I don't know I what put you... a, I put a clip of that, a picture of me. That, that... Hey, here I am. That's what. That's exactly what reminded me of it. Yeah. So I went through your Twitter beforehand, and you've got a three-second GIF of you just go with a really good-looking belt. That's what I mean, like for for back in the day, I mean, my friend Mike did an amazing job of them. It took him, I can't, uh, days and weeks of just painstakingly just making these things. It was freaking amazing. We call them threshold strips here. You know the uh, the gold strips between the doorway. To keep the carpet down, kind of thing. I don't know what you'd call them, but anyway, that's the name we would use. For well, no, the, what the, no, those are thresholds too. But these were kick plates, actually, like eight inch. I don't know, like, like this much. Okay. By like the width of a door, and it would go on the front of a door, and they call them kick plates. So, because if you open a door and you have packages, you kick the door open. Yeah. You don't mess up your door. You kick this kick plate. Uh, apart from Vlad, you know, there's going to be like Faith No More guy and Vlad's friend who's everywhere with him, and you yeah. know, and all that kind of thing. Harley. Do you remember a guy in the early Raw tapings who would wear a yellow T-shirt that just said, Bob Backlund, Bob Backlund, WWWF champion? Yep. Who was that guy? He was there for months, it seemed. I, he was just Bob Backlund guy. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think I ever officially met him, really. Um, but yeah, he wanted Bob Backlund. And I'm so upset I was never around when Bob actually came back because I'm guaranteed that guy lost his shit. <laughs> I, I think I'm trying to think Bob Backlund returned at the end of 92. So that would have just been when he was turning back up again, I think. Or was he back already? Yeah, I think he oh, was Maybe back. he's back already, man. Okay. Spry 40. Yeah, no, he loved me. Either way, he loved Bob Backlund. I was, I was like it back in the day where I was like, he's 41 years old and talking like he's got one foot in the grave. And, you know, he's broken down. He's 40, 41. I mean, no one even gets a main event slot in WWE unless you're in your 40s these days. How times have changed. Yeah, no kidding. Back when I started watching, guys like, like you know, Piper and Orndorff and all these guys, they were in their mid-30s when they hit, like, the big time. Like, I mean, I know Hogan, they had some other stuff, but when they were on TV, get their their initial push, they were all in their mid-30s. Well, according to... Which is crazy. The guys, the guys now in their early 20s are getting their big push. Yeah. With uh, Vince, uh, what did Vince say to Hulk Hogan? He was uh, Hulk Hogan was thirty eight. Vince McMahon, he was uh, thirty eight, and uh, Hulk Hogan was washed up. Oh, Vince! Oh, sorry, he doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ! <sighs> but yeah, thirty eight washed up. Same with Savage. Yeah, yeah. You guys are too old. Incredible. It's one of those. Well, you know, the more I suppose the 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 schedule the. You know, the amount of dates everyone works every year is a lot less. So, I mean, there's got to be some preservation sure. these days. How many uh, – this isn't anything to do with the script. I'm just interested now. Uh, with ECW, how many matches would you generally wrestle a week? Because I don't think you ever ran weekdays, did you? Was it only weekends? Usually just weekends. So, on occasion, we would do like a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sometimes we would do a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So, it was usually two days a week. Sometimes three. We, I'll tell you what, I'm going to ask you two more sets of questions, then we're going to get into a little game that, um, Ooh, yeah. that uh, I've, I've uh, forced other people to do on the, these interviews many times over. But uh, these are questions I'm sure that you've heard many times before. But, uh, oh, God, me and my lack of glasses. I'm sorry, I messed up your name. Uh, where did you get the dragon t shirt? Uh, I had that same shirt and got it from an outdoor flea market. Pretty much the same. My friend, again, Mike Norman, the guy who made the belts, um, he got me that shirt for Christmas when he said, oh, this cool shirt for John. He'd like it. <laughs> and that was it. So when they asked me to wrestle, I was 170 pounds. And I was fucking tiny. So I'm like, I'm going to wear a shirt. <laughs> and 
That's what I had. I borrowed a pair of red shorts from Donnie Allen. I had my sneakers and that dragon shirt. So that's what it was. North of Nashira has asked, do you still have that original shirt? I do not. That thing like disintegrated. That thing was ripped to shit, <laughs> shredded. I don't have much of anything at all. Oh, really? A so lot of shit you, just got a lot, a lot of shit just got thrown out. No, looking back, that was not uh, uh, pretty foolish. A foolish man threw all this shit away. <laughs> like there's there's these tops trading cards. When I was in WCW, I had already left, and Tops sent me five hundred of these baseball cards to sign and send back. I said, well, fuck you. I don't work there anymore, so I'm fucking keeping them. And I signed a bunch and gave them to my friends. I was just giving them out to my friends. Here, hey, these are cool here. And then like 450 of them went into a dumpster oh. and got thrown out. Was this like with a house move or something? Or do you just No, I just said, uh, yeah, I was, I, was in, I was in one of my fucking moods. I'm like, fuck this, fuck this. Like, I don't <laughs> need this shit. And my buddy Chris, who worked at Tops, he said, yo, what did you ever do with those cards? I said, I fucking threw them out. He looked at me like aghast. I said, what? He said, "If you hold, do you have any idea how much cards those would be worth if, if you would held them for like 20, 30 years? Like, what are you talking about? He goes, okay, one, they're autograph cards. I said, and two, they were made. So they're officially made for that set of WCW cards and any collector who wants a complete set has to have yours because otherwise it's not a complete set. Even though you never sent them back, they exist. I go, son of a bitch. <laughs> Did so, yeah. So I see now I see him, I see him go online. I found like seven of them one time at my parents' house. And I think I sold them like 300 bucks a pop. So let's see. So 450 times 300. Yeah. Fuck. I fucked up. Hang on. Are we talking six figures? I'm trying to think. Well, the thing is, if, if there was only 450, they wouldn't be worth as much because the, the market would be slightly more saturated. So, since there's only a, but they would be released, higher. but they would be released on my my schedule. I see. So you you would bleed. That's very clever. Just bleed them out over the course of you know Valentine's Day, right? Something like that. And if you go, hey, I got 450 of them. Come buy them. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I have five for sale. Uh, do, and do you knowing know, me, one day that might just throw him into a fire. God, don't say that. If you kept anything yeah. throughout your career of um, even sentimental value, even if it doesn't have any like collector's value, I have a couple original eight by tens from ECW. It's the triple crown one. It's got me with the tag belts with cactus, the TV belt, and the world title. I have a couple, pretty much eight by tens. It's pretty much all I have. Original stuff. Would you do you sell anything? I mean, I, I could plug other things here, but do you sell any sort of signed ECW memorabilia now, kind of thing, or just not bother with? No, it? I have some eight by. I just have I have like an Etsy shop where I have eight by tens, not original ones, just eight by tens up that people can buy. But that's pretty much it. Yeah. Maybe some shirts, shirt designs. I don't know. Oh, I don't, uh, I don't pay attention. Like I get invoices that, hey, we printed this shirt for you and whatever. Yeah, okay. I don't even look. I don't even know what, what how much money's in there. I just just because you mentioned shirts, uh, Jarrett, do oh, God, I can't read the names. We're in very light blue here. Uh, what was your favorite shirt to wear to the ring? Uh, it's not really my favorite. It's kind of like I would just throw a bunch in my bag and whatever would come out. I did like I had an all over print Aussie shirt. That I wore against Cactus, that uh, that I like. I like that's just a regular shirt. Like those other ones, I would never wear in public. Like just not my not my thing. Originally, the dragon shirt I probably would have worn, um, but once it kind of became my thing, like I'm like ah, I'm not gonna wear dragon shirts in public. It looks a little. Now people wear their own shirts all the time. But back then, I thought it'd be I'd be kind of lame wearing my gimmick shirt in public. Like it's gonna. Am I looking for attention? Did you uh, introduce Brian Pillman to the uh, yes. Mikey shirts, let's call them? Yes. Yep. He, uh, so won't be Eyeball. I forget the official name, but Liquid Blue makes all these shirts. 
So liquidblue.com, they have all these type of shirts that you've seen me wear. Um, he saw the eyeball shirt and told me it was cool. I said, here. So I, I gave him one um, because I had like four of them. And yeah, he liked it and then started wearing it. So I guess he went and got his own because the one I'd see him wear was not the one I gave him because the one I gave him was um, a little more worn, <laughs> if you will. Because it's like ring worn. It was ring worn, mm. yes, and it looked worn. <laughs> so, he liked it anyway. He's you know, yeah, because in the WWF like photo shoots from '96 when he'd gone over there, he was wearing that shirt in quite a lot of them as well. So he, uh, he gave him his look, definitely. He gave Brian Pillman his look. Look okay. at that. Because we were talking about merch, oh, God, I, I keep saying this. Forget what's on the script. So I'm just going to ask what I'm interested in now. Uh, what was your first Do piece it. of official merchandise apart from eight by tens? There was a shirt, and it would say, help me on it, I think, in red and blue, whatever, help me. It had me looking up doing this. It's fucking worst shirt of all fucking time. How many did he sell? And I, I hated that fucking shirt, and Spike Dudley would wear it all the time. <laughs> Why are you fucking trolling me, you fuck? How many, how many did you sell in the end? Three. Three? I think all the Spike. I think all the Spike. <laughs> Uh, I was going to ask, you know, the royalties that ECW was paying if they indeed if they indeed did pay royalties for anything at that time. Yeah, royally fucked. Yeah, I also do a, a weekly, very well, bi-weekly sometimes podcast with Shane Douglas, and he was t- talking nice. to me about the um, the figures from was it San Francisco toy makers, the original San Francisco toy makers or whatever, and I think Paul Heyman heard basically said that he owned the rights to everyone's likeness and name and ECW and he paid royalties to nobody for those two sets of figures, series of figures. Sounds right. Sounds about right. Were you in the games? I never had one made of me, so I didn't... Uh, oh, I thought, I thought you I didn't were... get screwed on that deal. Oh, I was going to say, I thought you were one of them in the in the series, so no then, I'm wrong. No, nope. no. Nope. Were you in the games? The second one. And I made the same that Shane Douglas made for his t-shirt figure. <laughs> well, you, well, you saved me asking that question at least. <laughs> I'm going to uh, I'm going to move on to the last of this set of questions that everybody was uh, asking about, and someone have written it really well. And there's about eight different versions of the exact same question. Let me just have a look. Someone had asked, uh, "What was uh, what was your objection to uh, Leonard Cohen?" Oh, that was fucking terrible. That was my objection. It was, it was so. I was traveling with Cactus, and we would play music, obviously, in the car. And we were driving down Interstate eighty, and I put in a Black Sabbath or an Ozzy Osbourne cassette, and he looked fucking aghast that I, I had this in. I go, what? He goes, Mikey. We had on Leonard Cohen, and you you put in the, the the evil satanic voices of Ozzy Osbourne. So he literally ejects my cassette and throws it out the window, and he puts in back Leonard Cohen. Now I don't know if people have uh, listened to Leonard Cohen. Uh, it's not exactly upbeat. It's not exactly for me. Something driving down the road. Um, it's going to keep you going uh, on a 300 mile drive, but it was fucking terrible. <laughs> and he, Mike, he, you have to appreciate the fine lyrics of Leonard Cohen. As you have to driving down interstate 80, look at the beautiful fall foliage and the beautiful Mikey nature. You need to, you need to appreciate nature. And I'm going, Jesus. Now, he wasn't really doing the cactus voice. I just do it because if I'm telling a cactus story, I can't just talk like this because it's not as exciting. I was going to say, it did sound a bit like Terry Funk as well. I was thinking it was Terry in the back. It's a mix. It's a mix. Uh, Terry, Terry Jack, yeah. Um, but then he said, Mikey, after the show tonight, we're not going to get a hotel. We're going to stay at an Amish bread and breakfast. I said, fuck it. An Am- so I don't know if Amish are people that do not live in the 21st century. They use horse and buggies and no electricity. They keep it old school. 
and he wanted to stay at an Amish bread and breakfast, bed and breakfast. So I declined <laughs> and I begged Taz and Paulie and Dreamer if I could ride back with them to Philly because I was not staying with Cactus. <laughs> yeah. But that was Leonard Cohen. So, so many like, and to Cactus, that shit he would use when he turned on me, when he went heel, setting up our, our singles match we had. This is the shit he would use in promos to talk about why he turned on me. So he turned on me for Leonard Cohen. He turned on me for leaving Doritos on his front seat because when I, he would drop me off at my house because I wasn't driving. He would drive me, drop me in my house. I would leave a bag. I never forget uh, the sweet chili Doritos they have now. They were Taco Bell Doritos back then. And I would leave the bag on his front seat. So by the time he left my house, got back to his house, he had eaten the whole bag of Doritos. Mikey, I ate that whole bag. I said, why? I couldn't help it. I said, right. So he turned to me and said that I would leave the Doritos, and it wasn't fair because he had an eating disorder. <laughs> and just little shit like that, like it just real-life stuff that he would just take in these promos to make it just seem completely absurd why he turned on me. How long before you started working with Mick Cactus, before you were told this is what's going to happen? I don't know how like fleshed out the entire feud was going to be, but I mean... Was it like fly by the seat of your pants at that time, or was it? Well, I don't. You've nodded at me then, so it's just you turn up to the ECW arena. It's like this is what you're doing this week. For the most part, so I knew we were building to a match with Cactus. Well, even when I teamed with Cactus, they told me that night, "Oh, you're replacing Terry Funk." I said, shut, the, shut the fuck up! Like, there's no fucking way that's gonna work. Like, please, I would kill me. If I came out replacing Terry Funk, but that was true as well. You really because Terry did Terry like double book and didn't turn up, or why did Terry not show? You know, up? I don't, I don't remember the story, but it was the night of the EC the NWA tournament, and it was supposed to be Cactus and Terry against the Public Enemy, and Terry wasn't coming, and they decided I don't know who they are. If it was Paulie or Cactus or Todd Gordon or whoever it was said that the only person that could replace Terry Funk that they wouldn't shit on would be me. I think they initially they thought 911, but I don't think they they were kind of like, eh. Yeah, they picked me. And it fucking worked. I don't know how or why, because I would have shit all over. <laughs> if I was a guy in the front row, I would have I would have been pissed. <laughs> um but yeah, so I knew when Cactus signed with WWE I don't know when he was finishing up. I think he told me like March. I think he told me, but he said, "Mikey, we got we got to get this singles match in." Because I thought he was going to do a thing with Dreamer. I thought that was going to go, and then he'd do the bluff with Dreamer. And he was like, "No, no, the bluff's got to be with you." I said, "Okay." And then, so I kind of knew two, three months ahead of time that it was going to be me and him. But I had until then, I really had no like I didn't know what we were doing month to month. I, I just knew that come March, I was going to wrestle Cactus. I didn't know leading up to it what was going to happen until usually that day. And how long beforehand did you know that Meanie and Stevie Richards will be the two to dance Cactus out of the building that night? When it happened. Oh, we never even told you. I was so pissed. <laughs> I was so pissed. I was like, fucking, no, I don't want, no, it should be me. Like, well, fucking why? And I'm like, ah, I was pissed. I was, I was, I was upset. Like, oh, no, I want... The happy reunion, Mikey and Cactus. Cactus gives me the big, the big uh, AOK send off, and then that was it. But then it kind of got hmm. cry right now. Just thinking. <laughs> was it during the? I really cry, but was it during this feud where you became, or you'd tell me where the transition was from you getting no offensive moves in to then being a wrestler like any other give and take, and just basically fighting like any other wrestler would kind of was with cactus my first actual match where i was like back and forth i think i did something with chad austin i think but that was the fucking drizzly shits but my first actually high profile thing doing actual competitive match was with jason jason knight because he was doing the manager gimmick the how do you like my suit and he was instrumental in helping me. I put a blog post about this too, um, where he would give me advice and this, and we had our first singles match. Um, he, he gave me shit. Like he sold for me. Like I had guys like 
um, that just wouldn't do anything. Like they didn't want to, they wouldn't do anything with me. Let's, let's put it that way. And, but Jason would work with me and he would do whatever and he would bump and he would just constantly give me advice. So I can't thank him enough for how helpful he was in the beginning. But it was that match with Jason where I started doing stuff. And then I think it was the next month or two or two months later, I started doing stuff with Cactus. And the much I was with Cactus, I started doing more and more stuff because we do a lot of double team stuff. And then just I started to get more comfortable and just learning from him. Uh, you know, and then guys would actually be willing to like do stuff with me. Like I'd still be basically get beat up. But they would let me get some shit in. It was just okay, we're just gonna beat Mikey up for five minutes and then be done with it. Thank you. you know, because then guys like um uh D Malenko came in and Ben Juan. I did a couple of tag team matches with them with Cactus, one tag team matches with Norman Smiley against Ben Juan Malenko. Ben Juan Malenko, that was the weekend I got two concussions back to back nights. Terrible. Mm. Fucking terrible. Would you ever get them diagnosed back in the day, or would you just know? There's no white flash, room spinning. What the fuck is going on? Okay, and you just said I got a bell rung. Next, yeah, we. But the, the, the first night I took a power bomb. It was in Fort Lauderdale. I took a power bomb from Benoit, and my head must have bounced off the mat four times. It, it was just power bomb. Like, yeah. Um, and then the next night, they picked me up. Chris picked me up for a power bomb, and Malenko came off the middle rope with a reverse bulldog, and he lost my head and just squashed my face out. I remember coming to with Ben Juan in the locker room going, Hey, you okay? You okay? You okay? And I'm like, What the fuck is going on? How many? How many in your career do you think you got? At least 14 that I can. I have, it, I have it written down somewhere. I went through and actually kind of thought, okay, yep, this is one. This is one. This is one. I got a concussion my first my first match against Mr. Hughes. And it wasn't even him. It was my own fault. Curtis was fucking amazing. Light as a feather, didn't feel a fucking thing. He matches over. He shit cans me out of the ring. And my left foot hit the middle rope. So instead of flying out of the ring and kind of rotating to my feet and then rolling, I just kind of went, Whoop, and then just kind of like a Muppet, just kind of <laughs> plop, face first, right on my head. So, uh, how I should have known. How hard were the ECW rings, or did it just depend on the building you were in? In the beginning, we had an old WWE ring. Right. Which was, which it was, it was stiff. It was, it was stiff. And then we got the one that Ted Petty owned. And that one was stiffish. It wasn't, you know, wasn't great. wasn't terrible. But that last one they had, the one we got made. Oh my god, it was fucking amazing. That, that was a fucking bumping ring. That was an old. Uh, that was an old Tennessee ring. The first, and then we got a new one made with the exact same specs. And that thing was like, oh, it was like a fucking pillow. It was amazing. I remember the old had their own we, we, sounds we, as well. Yeah, we cheated. That, that was a loud one. Yeah, that, that old Memphis ring was loud. But we had the, we had the the wrestling mat down, the pad down, and then we would coat. We would put a layer of carpet padding on top. So not only was it a nice bounce to it, it was slightly soft that really nobody would really notice. But when you when you hit it, it wasn't that hard. Like okay, it's a like a wrestling mat, but it had that little bit of ah. So it was it was nice. Get spoiled on that one. Have you ever been in a ring where it's like so, so so bouncy or got like too much give to it that it sort of affects your knees after a while? Yes, yes. Somewhere in Ca somewhere in Canada, it was just too. I was running across and the guy did a drop down and went to get up. And when he went to get up, I went to drop under for a leapfrog. And when he when he jumped, the the whole thing went like this, and my knee just <laughs> bink. Tear anything or just. Oh, no, my knees, my knees, my right knee is so fucked. There's no ACL in it. There's like, it, it needs, the right knee needs to be replaced, but I just won't get it done. So I just deal with it. As long as I don't have to pivot. If I can just walk straight, <laughs> I'm fine. If I have to turn or anything like this, it's bad news. It's funny because I did my ACL in, in 2020. I had the operation for it this past April. 
and man, it's slow going because I've got a sit down job. Essentially, this is my job. Oh, and you, yeah, yeah, it's if if I was up on it all the time, strengthening it up, it'd be one thing. But uh, man, it's slow going. The rehab, I think it's about ten months out now. And I ju- just to test it, I just did a tiny bit of a run, and I still can't run like that well at all on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's so like I have no ACL. Like they went in and they, they can't even find it. Oh, was it just like? Because uh, because they can it's happen, can't it? It can shred at the ends. You know where you've snapped it, and it can almost go like yeah. a split hair kind of thing, and then they can't really reattach it. And this is going back probably twenty five years. So there's like it's just gone completely yeah. by this point. We're used to it now. I'm used to it. That's yeah. doctors like the, the problem is the cartilage and the just the, the grinding. Mm. You know the, the the stability of my knee is not there, but I'm like ah, I'm so used to it at this point. Just. Bit. Grinding is what hurts. Ah, so I hear. In the uh, in the days, uh, we're going to do a game name association. So it's a simple one. I'm oh, going to give you um, a sentence, a description. You tell me the first name that comes to your mind. It could be ECW, WCW. It can be any way you've ever wrestled. And gotcha. this one is, and you can't say yourself, the funniest person in the locker room. Bobby Heenan. That was a slam dunk, then, wasn't it? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's. Easy. Yeah. Last man standing at the bar, drinking wise. I, I have to clarify these days. Oh, uh, uh, probably Sandman. That should have been a slam dunk as well, really. Um, okay. Yeah. Biggest bully. I don't ask that very often anymore. But would anyone qualify in, under that? Bully. Um, for me personally, bully would have been. Uh, Rock and Rebel. I think he's dead now, but mm. he was—he was—he was not nice to me. Like he was just—he treated me like shit. It just was just kind of a jerk. Not to you know. Later on, later on, after I was more established and he was trying to come back, or I'd see him on Indies, he was fucking nice as pie. But at the very beginning, man, he fucking—he gave me a hard time. Him and Mike Graham. Mike Graham didn't like me either for some reason. Oh, was he uh, WCW? Yeah, so he was agenting still at the time, wasn't he? Yeah, I don't know why. I like I never met him before that. He just was like a dick. So I'm like, okay, well, whatever. Uh, has have we ever found anyone who Mike Graham liked? Yeah, who paid him? Mm. Yeah, I, I, think well, I guess whoever paid him, pay. but I I don't know. He might have been a nice guy, but he was not nice to me. We we'll, uh, I'm not talking shit about the guy. He just he just didn't like me. Uh, Smelliest wrestler. I've, I've got to figure uh, that I know what name's going to come here. Mm, smelliest wrestler. Uh, Cactus had his moments. Um, who else? Smelliest wrestler. Mm, who you? Who, who? Who? What name was popping in your head? Balls. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, oh well, yeah, that's true. I didn't. I didn't really. New balls well, but I never really did much with him to really, really notice. But yeah, yeah he was a dirty man. <laughs> Most dangerous situation you found yourself in, in in a wrestling sense at least. So I don't know if you know, like crowd riots or something like that. Crowd riot? Mm. Well, they worked up with a couple with the Dudleys that were. It was intense. There was one at a National Guard armory where the uh, National Guard were actually hitting the the weapons closet. Um, <laughs> but I go, not good. That's when Tracy Smothers was shadow boxing with a dog. Was he in his tower uh, they had, at the time? Did he just got out of the shower? He, I have a shower, hold my watch, and he was, come on, dog, threatening the uh, police dog. That was a bad one. Uh, also, the uh, the fight with New Jack and Dances with Dudley, Adolfo. Mm-hmm. That was a, a crazy backstage incident. With Taz with my head through a glass window. That was fun. Mm-hmm. Have you uh, have you ever caused, uh, maybe not a fan riot, but have you ever caused like a fan to try and get you in one way or another? Something happened at one point with Bam Bam Bigelow, where he had thrown me out of the ring like he did with Spike into the crowd. 
And then, no, if fan hit me or kicked me, and then I get up and I punched him, and then Bammer was there in like three seconds, like just in case, because you know the fans go. It, you, you pick on one fan, but there's you know fifteen hundred of them, just just in case. So I did at one point when I hit the fan, Bammer was out there, and the locker room was out there within like thirty seconds. It was fucking uh, nice to see that everybody had my back. Um. Yeah, I don't know why. I just somebody. I I just got fucking pissed that this guy hit me or kicked me or whatever the fuck happened. And I don't even know if I hit the right guy. <laughs> That's the <laughs> best part. Were you present during the XPW invasion? Yes. I was out go? in the street. I was out in the street. It was fucking ridiculous. And I didn't know if it was legit, not legit. Like, what the fuck? Like, is this? Are we all getting worked? What the fuck is? But we went out there and we were fucking fighting. Like, and I. Two things I will never forget. I will never forget two guys were beating on somebody. I don't know who they were beating on. But I just remember Big Sal running across the street and just giving them big King Kong Bundy avalanche plants <laughs> against the fence. Where they just they just collapsed. And then after they were all leaving in their cars, Paulie looked at me and goes, Mikey, I think I just broke my hand. But yeah, it was uh it's interesting. I don't think the only I got other, to a fight. I don't, I don't even know why. The only other one I've heard of was maybe the the uh, fight in a bar over the road where that Tammy caused. But I don't know if you were in the, oh, I don't know at that the time. One. I don't remember that one. Maybe you were in WCW I didn't at go, the time, actually. Maybe I didn't really go out much. You know, I would go to like the hotel bar, and that was it. I didn't really go to. I didn't go to strip clubs. I didn't go to any of that shit. So I was mostly a, a hotel bound person. Next is most reckless person in the ring who would just, you know, lay it in potatoes. Sam in. Yeah, okay. Sam in. <laughs> as far as reckless goes, yeah. yeah. But 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 when I worked him in WCW, easy and light as a feather. I said, You've got to be fucking kidding me. That's a back what he goes, oh, that's a different place, kid. I go, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Did he not drink to the before the matches in WCW then? Nope. Really? I don't think they would have let him. Probably. Or if he was doing it, it was nowhere near in the excess it was in ECW. <laughs> uh, someone wrote on a previous page that I can't find anymore. Um, I, I think they may have given the date of like October 1995 and Sandman had dropped a guardrail on you. And he wanted, this person wanted to know if you remembered that. Um, not specifically. He dropped fucking everything on me. Let's be honest. Like, I'm he, he. I remember he. There was one point where he picked up a guardrail and he like mushed me against the ring with a guardrail. And then I was I was so pissed I just took it and I it was still connected, I think. And I took it. I just fucking swung it back at him. I said, "Fuck, Jesus!" <laughs> but yeah, I remember him squishing me against the ring with a guardrail. I remember that. Fucking hurt like hell. With ECW, did he um, throughout the years? Did he? progressively drink more before the matches as the years rolled on? Uh, I think at one well, at one point you hit critical mass. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I think uh, I think it's pretty much it, it, it maintained. It was pretty much, yeah, he brought in his big blue cooler with beer and vodka and you cut orange juice, so you... Even kale. Was it... Yeah, yeah. I don't think it got better, got worse. It's kind of just was. It was what it was. Uh, nicest person in wrestling, maybe even too nice to be in the business. Mm. Nicest person in wrestling. Drew Hart is very nice. Um, Actus is very nice. Guys were very nice. See cactus, cactus probably nicest guy in the business. Most high strung, like edgy, nervous, that kind of thing. Stevie Richards was kind of high strung back in the day, pretty pretty nervous. Not like a bad way, just antsy, on edge. On edge. 
Well, there are a lot of guys who are on edge thanks to a, a certain white powder that would make them edgy. I'm going to name it on that one. Yeah. But for, for me, Stevie like, was like, very. Like oh, you know, you know who else? You know, no, you know who could be fucking on edge? Fucking Guido, little Guido. He Guido, I love Guido, but he may be the craziest man I've ever met. <laughs> and I've met some crazy fucking people, but Guido is. I would say Guido is probably the most high strung. Overall, naturally, just a high strung person. Guido. I think we best have an example. Why the craziest? You know, I don't even know, like, just hard to explain. Like, he, okay, we were, we were in Montreal and we were driving back to Toronto. And it was Tajiri, Canning um, Decker was in the car. I think his brother was in the car. Assad might have. Anyway, we're driving back for this fucking shitty drive with Tajiri and then this, and Guido wanted a beer. So we stopped and got beer. And we had been up since I don't know, seven in the morning. And Guido had been drinking, I think, since seven in the morning. And I had to stop for beer. And he had to piss. Oh, come on, guys. I got this. I, come on, I, I got to piss, guys. Come on. So we stop and piss. And then, 20, hey, come on. I got to piss, guys. I got, okay, fine. So he's drinking the whole fucking time. And he's asking me all these fucking weird, random fucking questions. Like, we don't just fucking relax. Like, I don't know when we're going to get all there. I'm not from fucking Montreal. I'm not fucking from Toronto. I have no idea when we're going to get there. Ah, come on, Mike. Like, you have to have an idea. I said, fucking ask the driver. And just antsy about when we're we going to get there. How are we going to get there? Then he's asking me, Mike, is there going to be a bar when we get there? It's like, Guido, we're going to get there like 5 a.m. Like, I don't think there's going to be a bar open. Ah, there's got to be a bar open. Come on, help me out. <laughs> help you out. He found one. Son of a bitch. He found a bar that was open at like 5 in the morning. Uh, and he was pissed at me because I wouldn't go drinking with him. Hmm. <laughs> so, you know, I just want to go to bed. Like, ah, come on, yeah, it'll be fine. So I don't know when he sleeps. It doesn't sleep. I don't fucking know. But he is. He's erotic. He's awesome. But he's fucking, fucking out there. I've, I've heard that saying of it's five o'clock somewhere. But I thought it was PM. Apart from if you Guido. want to know where five o'clock, Guido. If it's five AM somewhere. And if you want to find out where, <laughs> just ask Guido. Next one is uh, most in trouble with the office. So of the major promotions you've worked, who would uh, frequently find themselves in trouble with the higher ups? Uh, Sabu. Hmm? Not in the trouble like, oh, God, he fucked up. But as in, like, Sabu would, would do what Sabu wanted to do. And if Sabu didn't want to do something, he wasn't doing it. So I, I just remember constantly hearing Sabu's name <clears throat> as far as trouble. But not, yeah. not, not trouble like bad trouble, but... M minor infractions. Uh, favorite travel buddies? Yeah. Uh, Cactus. Um, oh, you couldn't listen to your own music with Cactus. Well, that's true. That was only negative. Great stories, though. Great stories. Um, Spike Dudley was good to travel with. Um, for a while, I was traveling with... I, tro I drove with Taz, Dreamer, Paul E for a while. That was just fucking knowledge central. That, those fucking cards. Just, just asking questions like you wouldn't believe. Mm. And then when we all lived in New York, it was... Uh, Taz, Bubba, uh, Perry, Saturn, John Kronos, the Eliminators, and me. That was a fucking car ride. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, this is uh, nothing possibly related to you at all, but what do you think the worst gimmick or storyline in wrestling history was? Well... Ooh, and you're you're covering a lot of ground here. Yes, I am. I'll tell you what. I'll I'll, I'll um, slim it down a bit. The worst the worst gimmick ever. Yeti was bad. The Yeti or the Yeti? Yeti, I guess. Or Uh Yeah, the Yeti was bad. Fucking uh, the Gobby Gooker, Gooker was bad. Um, I just maybe stand alone. Gobby Gooker as a mascot wasn't bad, but the fucking build to the Gobby Gooker <laughs> made it really bad. Especially when everybody expected Lex Luger. Um, Santa Claus was the shits. Uh, 
seasonal. Man, there's been it's a very lot seasonal of character that it was probably good for about three weeks. Yeah, very, yeah. yeah. Uh, what else is bad? There's a lot of bad stuff, man. A lot, a lot of bad. But as far as gimmicks go, though, I can, Mikey Whipwreck was a shits. <laughs> uh, you don't have to give the number if you don't want to, of course. Uh, best single payoff for an event. So one event. What was your best payoff? Um. Well, I could, I could say my WCW stuff, because from 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 a technically from a per event standpoint, mm. I made a lot of money per match. But that was guaranteed though, as well. So I'm presuming anyway. Yeah. So all my WCW stuff was probably the most single day payoff, and again, guaranteed contract thing. But I the. Uh, ECW One Night Stand pay per view, the first one, was probably uh, the biggest one. Uh, let me have a look. The most talented wrestler you ever, ever worked with? The most talented ever. Mm. Fuck. I mean, it doesn't even have to be your favorite. It can just be, yep, the most talented guy ever, kind of thing. Um. Hmm. Most talented. Well, see, now there's there's different ways to look at this. We can look at talented as far as creativity goes. Then you look at talented as far as physicality goes. I I'll tell you what. I'll I'll narrow it down. And smoothest, always in the right place. Always. Lance Storm. Yeah. Lance Storm, Jerry, Jerry Lynn. I mean, as far as, if you want, if you're talking smooth. Landstorm, hands down. The most- second followed close a close second by Chris Candido. As far as being smooth. The most miserable wrestler in the locker room. Always a eel the donkey frown. Nothing cheered him up. Uh Taz had his moments for being a miserable, miserable person. Uh just angry all the time. Um Fucking, I can't think of his name now. Drawing a fucking blank. What do you look like? I, I, I can't even. <laughs> like it's. Let's just say right now, Taz. And if I come back, if I think of it, I'll say, "Oh, that's the guy who was fucking cranky as fuck." That's fine. Then. Uh, worst abuser of spray tan or baby oil. Ah, uh, Taz. <laughs> Heavy smoker. Uh, not not weed, just regular cigarettes. Uh, John Cronus. Biggest, Constantly smoking. Biggest ladies, man. Can't say yourself. Why well, be lying? Um, biggest ladies, man. Chris Chetty was uh, quite the ladies' man back in the day. Um, any of the guys really thought they were the devil, Jim Mitchell, thought he was a ladies' man. <laughs> well, he's got. See, probably Chetty. He's got that. Chetty, Danny voice. Doring, those guys were. Yeah. Oh, he does have the crooning voice. Uh, I've got a few more on this. Loudest spot caller. Sam. <laughs> I'd hear. I'd hear him a mile away. Aye. And then. Yo. Yeah. Get the fucking ladder, okay. <laughs> Did you hear that over there? We're getting a ladder. Uh, scariest bump you ever took? Well, the scariest one I took was that power bomb from Mike Awesome over the top rope to the floor through a table. Just because I was backwards. So I'm like, I don't like this. And actually ended up pissing blood for a week because I bruised my kidney. But the scariest one was my singles match with Cactus. I climbed to the very top of so in, in the ECW arena they had that first they had the, the that first stage, which was maybe you know three four feet off the ground, and then they had the second stage where the hard cam was, the music was, and everything up there. And when guys were jumping off that, they'd usually have a table on the second stage, or they would have tables on you know on the floor. I just decided, for some fucking stupid reason, it would be a good idea if I climbed to the top of the second stage and did a Randy Savage axe handle 
onto cactus. And I'm standing up there going, holy fuck. I can't, like, I can't, I like, oh my God, like, this is not good. Like, and I, and I was up there and I couldn't get down and I was going to do the big rainy savage, you know, the big like this and do the fucking jump. I would like this uh, and just fucking jump. <laughs> that blew out my knee. That fucking hurt like hell. You ever jump from really high and you, you feel your everything go tick, 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 mm. and you get that weird, like, yeah. I, I get it in the shins. The, it's like, you know, a shock absorber, but it just like all shocks into your shins when you jump off something high. I had it shins. And it, I felt like it went <laughs> all the way up. It, I thought, I, I said, I think I just killed myself. I, th- I think I just shredded my fucking innards. Does, does that count as the worst injury you ever got as well, or is that something else? Um, no, because I was, I mean, I fucked up my knee, but that, I mean, we, we got through it. It, it, it hurt like hell at, at the time of impact, but um, worst one was probably I did a, uh, a somersault dive on Luis Vicoli, and we were off somehow, and he kind of went like this, and the, the back of my knee smacked on the guardrail, and then my head teeter hit the ground, and I, I don't remember anything. I remember coming coming to in the ambulance with uh, Tammy Sitch was in there, and this was 1997 sunny when i looked up and, and she's above me in the ambulance and i just see her face and this big white light behind her i thought i was dead <laughs> she was like you okay you okay ah, the fuck's going on oh that was that was fucking so okay here's a fucking story Please. so they take me by ambulance because i was out finished the match somehow if you ever look it up it's a born to be wired show me versus Luis piccoli Worst finish ever. I give like a half at Louis on the on the top rope or the middle rope, and I kind of give like a super kick to his leg, and then somehow gave him a Frankenstein. Don't remember any of it. But come to in the ambulance, they take me into the fucking emergency room. They give me a thing, and they're going, "Okay, he's conscious. You know, vitals seem okay. Uh, he's definitely concussed, um, but we need to check him for internal bleeding." And I go, I'm like. I'm not bleeding. I hit my head. Well, they fucking turned me over on my side, cut my fucking clothes off, and then stick fucking something up my ass. And they go, he's not bleeding. I go, I am now. I am now. <laughs> and, I, and I look just look over, and there's Sonny looking at me. And I'm going, I am, um, fuck, I'm highly concussed. I just got something stuck up my ass involuntarily. And I'm looking over, and there's hot Sonny from 1997. I'm going, <laughs> oh, oh, my God. How does it nice to meet yeah. you? It's fucking terrible. So then we, I get back to the arena, and they were setting up the uh, the barbed wire for Terry Funk and Sabu. And I'm walking around the ring looking for my hat. <laughs> like I just walked out to just walk out, just, uh, just walk out looking for my hat because Paulie called me to the studio and he goes, "I want to go walk, look, watch this." And he goes, "What are you doing?" He goes, "You were looking for your hat." They sent security out to come get me. He said, "Come on." <laughs> Seven of my hat, my hat. Why the fuck I'd be looking for my hat at ringside? I don't know. <laughs> Did it make it onto the tape? I don't think so. Oh. My, I would have left it. Like, the Mikey's just fucking shot. Just lights are on, but nobody's home. Just wandering around ringside <laughs> looking for a hat. <laughs> that may not have existed. Do you know what? I mean, there's got to be somewhere in the archives. In WWE, someone must find that as a blooper. That's got to, that's got to be an all-time they, one to put on. They have it. If they have it, I don't know. Like what? I don't. I don't know what part of the raw footage they actually all have. Yeah. Uh, a few more of these. Worst driver. Oh, there's Chetty. Chris Chetty. Or well, yeah. As far as people would know, Chris Chetty. Biggest river. Um. Well. Kurt Henning. From my experience, just just from what I've heard, uh, Kurt Henning, Bam Bam would rib on occasion, but from whatever I, Kurt Henning, from what I've heard, the biggest ribber, him and Owen. Um, but me personally, just seeing things uh, that I probably can't talk about is Bam Bam. Oh, mm, uh, can't talk about. Well, that that just adds to the intrigue now. No, maybe one day we'll have to. Yeah. Uh, I'll disclose. Yeah, but yeah. Would... Is there some sort of statue of limitation that needs to run out first? Of, thir- of of twenty five uh, plus years. 
Well, I was kind of involved without being involved. So that's I was like, I don't want to fucking stooge it off. So maybe one day I'll... Maybe. I'll uh, we'll save that for part two. We'll put it that way. We'll save it for part two. Yeah, uh, part two. Uh, part two more. Two. Most legit tough badass. Uh, Rick Steiner? Yeah. Or Well, people people I've, I've dealt with, not necessarily... Obviously, Ming... Haku is obviously the biggest fucking badass. Um, but... Um, yeah, Perry Saturn was a badass. Um, former Army Ranger, badass. I mean, he got shot. He got shot in the face and still fought people off. So, yeah. Mm. Perry um, Saturn, I'd say, is a fucking pretty badass. Definitely. Uh, last one is most memorable backstage fight. New Jack and Adolfo dances with Dudley. Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, the Flagstaff. The mecca of shit. So something happened where Adolfo dances with Dudley, went to give Jack a back suplex on the floor, or something happened on the floor that Jack didn't like. He thought Adolfo was shooting on him. So Jack matches over, I guess. Jack comes back to the curtain, and he's hanging behind, just just behind the curtain, and he's on his kind of knees. He's got like one leg up, and he's kind of like I thought he's like blown up, right? And he's hanging. Adolfo comes through the curtain and Jack fucking whacks him with a fucking nightclub. Right to the fucking face or the head. Adolfo, for some reason, some fucking night, he must be a fucking badass too, was still conscious. And they start fighting. So now there's a big fucking big pull apart in the locker room. So they fucking break him up. Fuck you, fuck you, this, that, and all this other shit. And then for some reason, Taz and New Jack start arguing, kind of getting into it. So I kind of get Taz and now I know when someone's getting in a fight and you're doing a pull apart and it's a legitimate fight, you don't grab the arms because at least they can, if something happens, they can protect themselves. Right. So I had Taz kind of one hand around his, his waist trying to say, come on, Taz, come on, Taz. Mikey brother, get the fuck. He took my head and just, and just pushed it this way. And my head went backwards to a plate glass window I look and I go, oh, and I just see the fucking, we're like the deck of this flagstaff was like a, on, on a fucking mountain. And I just remember going like this, looking over and going, oh shit, and looking down and seeing the Lehigh Valley River down below. And I'm about to plummet to my death backwards. Yeah. So luckily I didn't. Luckily my back stopped it and that thing didn't fall down. But uh, yeah, the back of my head was all cut up. Like, thanks, Taz. What was the okay. original issue between. Jack and dances. I think just a suplex. Just purely I don't know that. if there was other shit. I, I don't know if there's a, there's a backstory to it, but whatever happened, something happened during the match that Jack did not like and he thought Adolfo was shooting on him and just... So I, I'd figured there was something more build up, you know, clash of personalities before that, <laughs> that happened. You know, just It could have just been that. Ha- you, you, you would think there had to be, but you never, you never know. Of um, what we've got left, Higher or Hyler or Higler or however he spells his name, I'd love to hear uh, Mikey talk about his WCW debut with Kidman. They tore it up and then Mikey was buried, it seemed. Did they steal the show and upset the people? What's up? Yeah, Virgil. What? Virgil? Virgil bitched. Yeah. So we had, had the batch. We get about 10 different finishes. Uh, Mikey, you're up with your finish. What is your finish? Stunner. Okay, you're up with your finish. Uh, then Jimmy Hart comes over. Kidman, you're up with your finish. Then Arn Anderson comes over. Mikey, you're up with your finish. Then Mike Graham comes over. Hey, you're up with your finish. Well, Orndorff comes over. Hey, you're up with your finish. So I said to Kidman, I said, what the fuck do we do? He goes, whatever we hear last. So Dusty came over. He said, Mikey, baby, up with your finish. 15 minutes. I said, okay. So at that point, I'm going in the hiding. I don't want anybody else talking to me. I don't want to fuck <laughs> uh, And then somebody came over and Kidman's up with a finish. God damn it. Okay. So <laughs> we had the match and uh, Dusty told me, Mikey, just do your stuff. He said, it's it's uncensored. If you want to get a little hardcore, but not crazy hardcore stuff on the floor, go for it. Whatever you want to do. I said, okay. So we have the match. It went really, really well. Um, and the match after us was Stevie Ray versus Virgil. 
battle for the NWO black and white. Um, I guess that that high profile match that everybody wanted to see was uh, overshadowed by Scintil- scintillating uh, match up there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I heard that Virgil complained um, that we did too much. And that was the end. They took the belt off Kibben the next night and put it on Ray. And that was pretty much the end of me. And I was just like, oh, okay. Then you can wrestle Scotty Riggs for no reason at Spring Stampede. Okay, cool. Then you're going to go hide for a while. And you'll do a couple Saturday night matches. And then, oh, randomly, here's a fucking match on Thunder with you, Brian Nobbs, Hack, all these guys, the hardcore match. Okay, cool. Oh, now you're going to wrestle Van Hammer at the Great American Bash for absolutely no reason whatsoever. How was Van Hammer to work uh, let's see. at this stage of his career? So then I wrestled in the junk shop. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I remember looking at the board and seeing, because they added me, again, last, every time I was booked on a pay-per-view, it was last fucking minute. They called me like two days before, every time. And I remember looking at the board and seeing Van Hammer and Mikey, Van Hammer up, and I'm just staring at the board like, oh, fuck, what, what? Give me somebody, give me Hoovy, give me somebody Ray, give me somebody I could work with or something. Like, and I'm like, I, I uh, okay. And Bobby Heenan is standing next to me. And he goes, what do you got, sheep dick? I go, Van Hammer. And Van Hammer looks at me and goes, Mikey, you're going to see, I'm not as bad as they say I am. And Bobby Heenan, without missing me, goes, you're right, he's worse. <laughs> and that just wasn't good. Like, I wasn't in a bad mood that night. Like, I just wasn't into it. I think I slipped off the top rope at one point. I just, like, I just fucking killed myself. Like, fuck, this is fucking horrible. Embarrassing as fuck. I remember looking at Bobby, and Bobby's just like, like, yeah, fuck me. Mm. Not fun. Uh, aside from Bobby, of all the WCW uh, big names, your Goldbergs, your Scott Steins, your Kevin Nashes, who were the guys who had time for you, and who were the guys who uh, acted like big stars? Well, I can tell you one... Kurt Henning. I before my match with Kidman, I introduced myself to Kurt because I'm like, holy fuck, Kurt Henning, like this is fucking great. And shook my hand, totally blew me off. Like, yeah, okay. And just walked away. I'm like, well, that sucked. Fucking Mr. Perfect just fucking blew me off. Fucking great. Um but then I met Bobby, and Mom's like, oh, fucking great, Bobby. Yeah, fucking amazing. He was, that was a fucking great introduction to somebody, right? Um, and then after the match with Kidman, Kurt Henning comes up and goes, Kurt Henning, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm like, oh, Kurt, I met you before. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, that didn't count. He goes, I just thought you were some other shithead they brought in here. He has no idea what the fuck he's doing. He goes, you can work. Welcome aboard. And he shook my hand. Huh. So I'm like... Hold. So now I'm on fucking cloud nine. Like Bobby Heenan is fucking amazing. Had a great match with Kidman. Kurt Henning just told me I could work. Like I'm fucking, this is fucking great. And then I got buried and then did nothing. <laughs> and then Evan Carey just won the cruiserweight title. Fuck it. Yep. <laughs> that tells you what, I, what, I, what I, I wanted to work so bad back then. Like I just wanted to work. And when I went back to ECW, I told Paulie, I go, Paul, I just want to work. Like, like I, I, my body enjoyed getting paid to sit home. Like my body felt great, um, but I just, I wanted to work. Tell me now if I could pay and get paid to do nothing, I would fucking love it. Like I, I saw the interview you did with Barry Darso, where he said, "Oh, I went to WCW and Eric signed me, and I worked like once every two months." I'm going, "Yes, it was fucking amazing." But I wasn't at that point in my career where I was like, "Okay, we're doing that." I wanted to actually work. He even got better for him at one point. I mean, they made him the golfer, Mr. Hole-in-One, so he could carry his golf clubs with him everywhere. Perfect. Oh, we're in, we're in Florida? Great. Yeah. I'm going to ask oh, you... Augusta. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask you... Well, they were based in Atlanta, weren't they? So I don't know where Augusta yeah, is so. in, compared to Atlanta. My American geography is in there. I'm going to ask you one more, Same maybe state. two, if it's, uh, if it's, if it's very uh, short answer. Uh, but this fella, Chris says hi, in fact, is his name. Uh, Hi, can you please talk about the time that James Mitchell, or the Sinister Minister, as he was called in ECW, blew off his finger when he was screwing around with the thing that shot fireballs after his What Are You Thankful For promo? Okay. So, 
he had this little thing. It was a copper tube, a pipe, with uh, a, a button and I don't know if it was like a nine volt battery. And magicians used it. You would take uh, an eighth of a sheet of flash paper, crumple it up, stick it in there, and then when you hit the button, it would shoot a fireball out. He says to me, ah, Mikey, I'm going to make a chic gimmick. I said, okay. So now he takes an entire, not an eighth of a sheet, an entire sheet of flash paper, and he is crumpling it up, and he's trying to get it in this little fucking copper tube. There's no way this is going to fit. He goes into his bag, grabs a fucking toothbrush, and starts fucking jamming it the fuck in there. Well, as he's jamming it in there, he didn't take the battery out, and he hit the fucking button. So basically, he made a pipe bomb. Bam! This fucking thing goes. He goes, ah! Oh. And he goes like this, grabs his hand, and looks down. And there's this hole in his hand, and his fingers, and just blood is like coming out and pouring we go running to the bathroom in the sink, and we're now we're running his hand under the water to kind of clear the blood. He's holding it, and there's a giant fucking hole in his hand, and his fingers are all fucked up, and his hands like this. My, and my head, I'm, I just hear like for this bout, this concussion bomb that just went off. And we're standing there and saying, and he's holding his wrist like this, and he's sitting there. And Sandman comes and goes, "Yo, that's great! <laughs> Got to use this on a fucking promo." Meanwhile, his hands fucking blown the fucking bits. And we're standing there like, oh, my God. And he, he just stops. He looks at me and he goes, ah, Mikey, you seem to have a bit of my fingers hanging from the bridge of your nose. <laughs> and I look in the mirror and there's blood is all over there. Like there's like skin bits all over my face. And I'm just like, oh, Jesus. Like Pulp Fiction, when that they shot Marvin in the face, the kid in the backseat. Yeah. And his head just explodes against the fucking windshield of the back window. That's what like my face looked like. I'm like, oh my god. So now I'm like trying to wash my face off. He's over here bleeding like this. And as he's standing there, he goes, oh. And he looks down and he pulls his jacket away. He had on a black shirt, and you could see where it, his black shirt looked wet, right? He rips his shirt open, and you just see this this hole in in like his stomach. Not a huge hole, but it's like enough to be. Pretty ugly looking. And he goes, and he fucking collapses into a chair. It was, what the fuck? So, what happened was, it, it, it seemed like it was like a movie where the, the baby face makes a giant comeback, saves the world. It's all over. He looks down and he's fucking mortally wounded. That's what it looked like. And he, so, he like almost passes out. He's sitting in a chair. They take him away in the fucking ambulance. Now, Tajiri and I are freaked the fuck out. Because he was going to make this fucking thing. And then during our entrance, he's going to shoot it between me and Tajiri's head. So, <laughs> it was me and Tajiri's head or his hand. So, I'm guessing, okay, but I'm like, well, that could have been fucking bad on live TV. But I remember, I call him after the, after the pay-per-view match. I call him up. I said, hey, how you doing? Do you need anything? He goes, ah, yes. Bring me a beer and a Burger King cup. Because they won't let me have beer. So, he wanted me to bring him beer and a Burger King cup uh, so he could still drink beer. And I go, Paulie goes, how was he? I go, he's going to be fine. <laughs> but he was in the hospital a couple of days. He was, he was going well. I'd love to interview him. He won't do an interview with me. I spoke to him no. and he won't, and I don't know why. And he watches hmm. and he won't do it. I don't know. There you go. Come on, James Mitchell. Come on, do an interview with me. Just before I let you go, when we do the plugs. Um, he's fucking awesome. He's an amazing fucking guy. I know. That's why I really want to talk to him. But there you go. You can't force him, I guess. Uh, just very, very yeah. quickly, uh, a lot of people ask this. Matt Berg specifically, how much money does Paul Heyman still owe you? Um, A lot. But I say this. Without Paul Heyman, I would have no career, career in wrestling at all. So even though, yes, technically, ECW owes me money, I have my whole career to thank because of him. So I call, I, I call it Squaresville. Yeah. Call us even. I know you don't want to give the number, but are we talking four figures, five figures, or six? Uh, uh, five. Five figures. On that note, thank you so much for joining me. It has been a pleasure. And I, pleasure, and yeah. I would not say that if it didn't mean it, I assure you. Uh, just before I let you go, uh, do you want to hit me with the plugs again? We've got Woo Games, we've got Hive, we've got your socials, anything else you can think of? No, 
I don't really, I don't really push much. I don't uh, really make many. I'll be at WrestleCon for the uh, Wu Game guys. I'll be there with Perry Saturn and Raven and Sabu and all them guys, Terry Reynolds, Sonny Ono. Um, but yeah, I don't really do much else at this point. Um, I have some things coming up. Uh, I'm doing an I'm doing a death match with Danny DeMonto WrestleMania weekend for ICW. That should be interesting to say the least. So they paid you well then, definitely. Oh well, yeah, I don't know what to expect. I mean, I know what to expect, but I don't know what to expect. Um, but yeah, that's that's really pretty much it. Like Woo Game, Woo Dot Game, check it out. Uh, like I said, if you're if you're interested in online gaming and things like that, definitely check it out. And uh, the Discord people are very willing to help and figure it out. So if I can figure it out, anybody can figure it out, really. There you go, then. So I'm going to uh, close this very quickly. Thank you very much for watching. We'll catch you again next time. Woo Games once again, and all the other links right. will be in this video. And every video that I do, they'll be very easy. And thank you, Mikey, for entertaining yes. us all so much. That's right.